Hi, I'm Kurt Fernley, Paralympian and proud person with a disability. And I'm Sarah Shans, mum of a bright, bubbly, frozen obsessed kid with a disability. I can do a cartwheel. She's a bit of a badass. Yep, she sure is. Come on, let's go to New York. It's November, the air is crisp, my fingers are cold, and my friends are waiting for me at a nearby restaurant. When I arrive, they were really happy to see me. I've just won the New York Marathon, and we're ready to celebrate. The thing is, to get in with my friends, I have to go up a staircase. I'm stuck outside. A friend takes me around the back, past the rubbish bins, and we find our way into the restaurant through the kitchen. Now I'm used to this. It isn't my first time. I've had to get into a building through the back door. My mate is too. You see, he's Jewish. And as a young man, he had to use the back door to the restaurant because of who he is. Things might have changed for him, but some 20 years later, I'm still stuck outside because of who I am. I'm not disabled because I can't walk. I'm disabled because community keeps putting steps in front of me. Let's take a look at the case Sitter versus Cawthorn. This case made its way to the High Court, not because of the injustice of the case, but on a legal technicality. Which court can rule on disability discrimination? This all started with David Cawthorn, a gutsy Tasmanian who sails the Sydney to Hobart most years. He's a passionate disability advocate and has put his life on hold for years fighting for equality. He explains what Parliament Square is. Like outdoor dining, garden area and everything, but surrounding that is going to be bars and cafes. There's government offices there, as well as a, um, a hotel, a accommodation hotel going there. So, David, you spend a fair bit of time in this part of Hobart. If we were going to catch up, where would we meet? I'd go to meet you at the Customs House Hotel. As you turn looking up Murray Street, you actually see a fairly steep hill, which has got a fairly steep incline to get up it. Starts getting steeper as you get further up the hill. You probably get about a quarter of the way and it starts, you've really got to start, you really start struggling. You'll come to a set of stairs about halfway up the yep. hill. For me, I'll have to keep going further up the hill, probably about three quarters of the way up the hill, if not a little bit more, that you'll come to the entrance to the plaza. As David just described, this development is situated on a hill. There are three entrances, two on the top side of the hill, which are accessible, and a third the one in question is a grand staircase on the lower side of the hill. With all new buildings in Australia, there are rules that a developer need to follow to ensure it's accessible. So what is it about this development that has been so controversial? Nick Morris is an access consultant based in Melbourne. Is there a case for access to premises? It's decidedly grey. And the reason it's decidedly grey is because... Is an extra 30 metres of pushing up a hill when you've already gone 90 metres discriminatory? What about the process and the emotion of connection, like entering a space through the front? Had they closed that entrance off or had they turned into a grass slope or something like that that was inaccessible for everyone, then we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. And this is the bitter pill that people living with a disability have to swallow. What do you mean? I feel like I'm being told two out of three entrances should be good enough. And and even still, there is a voice in my head screaming at me, this is my problem, that I should be grateful just to enter this space, not on my terms, but on their terms. And that, that just feels a bit shit. Robin Banks uses Hobart's Parliament Square regularly for work. She was also Tasmania's Disability Discrimination Commissioner when David first raised this issue. And this legal stuff can get pretty technical. So Robin's going to break it down for us because this case is quite extraordinary. 
Very shortly before the hearing, like uh, I think a week before the hearing, the respondent, CIDA Group, um, indicated that it was going to challenge the tribunal's ability to hear the case on the basis that they say that there's a defence to what they've done under federal law, under the Federal Disability Discrimination Act. This wasn't the first access to premises case in Australia. Kevin Cox, he's from Brisbane, and brought a similar case against the Queensland government nearly 30 years ago when he took them to court over the Convention Centre development in South Brisbane. Everything was equitably designed except for the front stairs where there was 27 or 29 steps and 50 yards either side were lifts but you had to go through the car park and you couldn't enter through that front door. And so that was a sticking point. But I believed in the Anti-Discrimination Act under indirect discrimination, if I wasn't being treated um, differently to people without impairment, then I didn't know, you know, that act clearly to me said I was being discriminated against. What's it like? recounting this time in your life? It brings uh, many emotions. Not one day passes where you're reminded that you're not fully valued and society through its attitudes continues to reject you. As a person who has been told I can't enter a restaurant because I'm a fire hazard, hearing Kevin Cox get so emotional about his case almost 30 years on, it gets me. And I have one question. Why? Why on earth are we still fighting the same battle to be allowed in the front door? The High Court handed down its verdict on David Cawthorn's case in May 2022. Hello. So how are you feeling, mate? Feels like I've been kicked in the guts and hit to the, and fallen to the ground. So David Cawthorn lost his case against property developer Citigroup. Group. But remember, the High Court was not ruling on whether the Parliament Square development is accessible or not. It was ruling on the very technical issue of which court is allowed to hear the case. So Sitter welcomed the decision and Managing Director Stephen McMillan said, We do not believe that Parliament Square has been built in any way to discriminate against people with disability. And last year they sent us a statement with more detail on this position. And you can find that on our website. Five years of legal battles and this case has not been heard on its merits. Simeon Beckett is a barrister who worked on the case. This is the brutality of, of litigation. And if anybody listening out there has ever been in the position of being up against a major commercial law firm who are very well funded by um, an organisation, a company, or whoever it might be with unlimited amounts of money, then they can exhaust the other side. So what does this case mean for the next person who is unable to access a public space? A person with uh, who has a disability and has a complaint that they want to make, they can still go to the Australian Human Rights Commission or to their state or territory Equal Opportunity Commissioner, make a complaint and then the matter will be conciliated um, and then referred to in the federal system to a court or to a tribunal in the state system. The complaint system is still there and it still works to a degree. One reason it won't work as well as it has in the past is because of that costs issue. One in six people living with a disability also live in poverty. So having to find tens of thousands of dollars to pay legal bills is going to be impossible. What people have lost is the ability to run their case without the danger of getting an adverse cost order if they fail. So that's 
a major diminution in the access to justice aspect. This was a David and Goliath battle that wasn't meant to end like this. David Cawthorn was meant to take on the big guy and win. But it seems the system in place to protect us, the legal system, can seem inaccessible for people with disability. I've known David since 2018, as we've been working on this case really closely, and he is an extraordinarily strong and resilient character. He's been working on disability access since forever, and he's a fighter. And um, even though he's had a couple of kicks in the guts, as he says, on the way, um, he's not giving up. And, you know, we need people like that. So if it's now harder to raise issues of discrimination through the courts, don't we need to take a look at the laws? Disability Discrimination Commissioner Ben Gauntlet thinks it's time to act on this. I think it's undoubtedly clear we need to assess whether the Disability Discrimination Act is still fit for purpose. And one of the things that we need to strongly look at is whether the complaint mechanism whereby a person with a disability bears the onus of making the complaint and also potentially the cost going forward is appropriate. Instead, what we need is a regulatory regime where, for example, a regulator can pass civil penalties on organisations or individuals who behave in a discriminatory manner. These reforms the Disability Discrimination Commissioner is talking about would be game-changing, life-changing. We'd no longer need to risk everything just to show that we'd been discriminated against. And as one of the most marginalised and disadvantaged communities in Australia, this would change lives. Why does having access to public places like Parliament Square in Hobart even matter for people with disability? Well... Being out and about in your community has benefits you probably didn't even realise. Ilan Wiesel is an Associate Professor in Urban Geography at the University of Melbourne, and he talks about these things called encounters. 99.9% of the people in the city, millions of people are stranger to you. But you encounter all of them all the time. You go out and you, you see people in your neighbourhood, you see people on the way to work, and... Those encounters are a really important part of inclusion, being recognised by that stranger that you meet and they nod to you or they even do not acknowledge your presence, but uh, they just accept you being there. And there's an element of recognition in that, recognition that you belong, that you're an equal citizen of the city, of the country. And when you're not being able to access public space, you miss out on those encounters. And I know that unless you are missing out on these encounters or you've been told to crawl up a flight of stairs if you want to get into a place, then it's hard to really understand. (sighs) I really need some good news, Kurt. Anything, something, throw me a bone. Hi, Sarah. I've got some news for you. We've found a way that we can relodge our complaint under the Tasmanian law. So you're ready for another fight then? Um, yes. As I've said before, I'm a dog with a bone and I'm not going to let this bone get away. Are you ready to, to go into year seven of fighting for access to public places in Tassie? You can now go back and fight it on its merits and not its legal technicalities. So I guess I'm wondering, are there places getting access right without lengthy legal battles? One place that comes to mind is the Opera House in Sydney. Look, it's not perfect, but it's come a long way over the past five years to make it an accessible landmark. I still find it strange pushing up towards the Opera House and seeing just so many stairs. So I'm interested to find out what's the Opera House's plan to make sure that accessibility doesn't stand in the road of people with disabilities living their lives. My name is Janelle Ryan. I work in accessibility operations. How important is accessibility in a venue like this? Vital. I mean, the Sydney Opera House is iconic. 
it's it means a lot to Sydney siders, to Australians. And it is absolutely vital that as many people as possible come to the Sydney Opera House and, and see culture and art inside. Can you do accessible and beautiful? Yes. You can do accessible and sexy as well. Can I just say that? <laughs> I don't think that is said enough. <laughs> and I do. It's true. You can. <laughs> I, hey, you, I'm on board. <laughs> I do think these lifts are very sexy and beautiful. Um, the access journey of someone coming to the Opera House, where does it start? It starts, to me it starts at home, and I think that's an element that's not always acknowledged. Um, some some public buildings are like, well, it starts the minute you, you step it through the front door, well, or, you know, come into the building. But that's not the case, because people won't come to the building if they don't feel like it's accessible. So it is about encouraging community to come, it's about ensuring that we have um, shows that are suitable, that are Auslan, that are audio described, having a website that people can get information from. Um, and then once you step onto the site, then the physical accessibility journey begins. And that started this morning when I, when I pulled up at the almost 80 to 90 metres away from the Opera House. I was met by Evelyn, who would drive me in. We have a welcome team, essentially. They wear orange shirts, so they're quite visible. Uh, and they're basically on site every day assisting. So if you need assistance, they're there to guide you, to show you the way through. Because it is a building that doesn't have a big welcome sign in front red door, um, you, people need a bit of advice on how to get around it. Then when you get into the entry, is the entry up the steps? No, absolutely not. You, uh, you don't get into the building up those terrifying... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard the monument monumental Look, steps to find... And except they're, amazing, parents, except they're, they're amazing. Except by They're amazing, but they're, they're terrifying. <laughs> the way into the building is actually underneath the monumental steps, and it's the way everyone goes. There are internal stairs and there are, is a lift, so there are two public entry ways that are, that are accessible. How important is it to have an entry into the building uh, with you know, people with disabilities and their non-disabled peers. Well, no one wants to go to see a show and then one friend peels off and goes, I'll see you in half an hour when we get to my seat, you know, I'm going back a house. That's, that's not what you want to do. When you're going out, it's a social experience. So you want to stay with your friends. And to me, that's just a logical transition from, from making your building accessible to making it a kind of living, breathing community space that you can go in with everybody else or your family um, and all stay together. The Sydney Opera House was built in 1958 and it has a front door that I can enter through with my family. Equal access to public spaces can be done. The people that work in these buildings, that make these decisions, they have to see me as an equal. So it's hard to believe that in 2022, it's harder to access the law to fight for equality than it was in 1992. But this is the case. People with disability are some of the most marginalised in Australia and we face discrimination every day. And if we can't get access to public spaces, right? Well, what hope do we have for the more complicated conversations? Being able to enter through the front door should be the starting line. To be tripping up here, that's tough. That is really tough. For more Auslan versions of the podcast series Let Us In, subscribe to the ABC Australia YouTube channel.